Hello, everyone. I'm Leonel August Rodriguez, the VP of Business Development for Access Medical Labs. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on another Access Live, where we bring you insight from leading medical experts. We do ask that all questions are submitted via the Q&A, as they will be answered at the end of the lecture. So today, by popular demand, we have an individual who is no stranger to Access Live. He has close to 30 years of experience as a physician and has been an athlete for over 30 years. He is the medical director of On Point Medicine and Total Nutrition Technology. Without further ado, Dr. Jerry Ferris. Thank you, Leo. And again, thank you for all attending. Again, I'm like most of y'all. I had clinic today. And um, again, I just feel always a pleasure to talk about topics. And tonight we're going to talk about you know, I, I, as I was talking to Leo about this, not my favorite topic because, you know, we're all kind of over the whole COVID thing. But I think that I'm going to try to give you some information and a bit of a different approach. Um, I retired from clinical medicine as an ER doctor in May of this year. So I was on the front lines the entire time from the outbreak, whether you want to call it February or March of 2020 till May of this year. So I really got to see this stuff up close and personal. Um, I'm going to try to present mostly data. I have a whole lot of opinions. I'll try to keep those to myself. Please ask me in the chat room or ask uh, in a question, and I'll, I'll try to give you some answers. So this is the triple demic because, unfortunately, we're going to face three infectious diseases. Um, again, we're already in, into COVID season already, but we're going to face two others. And the reason we're going to bring this up is now we're going to start to see combinations of this. Okay. So what is it and will it affect me? You know, it's the combination outbreak. It's COVID. We know COVID won't go away. It's like, you know, it's just, you know, we're all tired of it. RSV, I mean, it's RSV has been around forever. And now you throw in influenza. And I can tell you last year, still working in the ER, we began to see both of the more than one infection simultaneously. So people coming in with COVID and RSV, people coming in with RSV and influenza. So when you start to stack these two or three, I never saw all three at one time, but when you start to stack these infectious diseases, one on top of it, they can have an exponential effect on the patient. Um, we do have this potential problem of co-infection. We unfortunately take care of an unhealthy population with lots of comorbid conditions. So that puts them at increased risk for worsening disease, hospitalization, morbidity, mortality. We're going to talk a little bit about immune compromise with viral reactivation because I saw a good bit of this and I don't know how many people were aware of this. And so we're going to talk about that and we, we cannot we'd be remiss to not talk about long-term effects because unfortunately all of these viruses have potential long-term effects. So let's start with COVID. The, the CDC data on that, there has been over 6 million infections and 1.1 million deaths. I can remember in early March, I talked to somebody who had data from the state department that said, we're going to lose 500,000 people. And I laughed at them and that I was wrong. So it's um, it's it's it was worse than we thought, and it's still not going away. Even most recently, if you look at it, there's been an uptick in COVID just in September with an 8% increase in infections and 4% increase in death rate. So those, again, are st still small numbers, but, you know, here it is. It's it's again, and it's not going away. These new variants, which the new one is XBB. They are highly contagious. They tend to be less deadly than the originals. The one that's probably of most concern to many of us, especially in the functional medicine world, is that 10% of these COVID infections develop long COVID. And we're going to touch on long COVID because there's not a lot that we've come up with to solve long COVID. And the cost of long COVID is a staggering $9,000 a year to treat. And the problem is you get long COVID, you take people that are professionals who can no longer do their job because of fatigue and brain fog and immunosuppression. So long COVID is a real deal. 
So how do we get, how does the COVID affect us? You know, it's the virulence has something to do with this NLRP3 inflammasome. So all this is in your um, cell and what this inflammasome does, and it's a collection of, of inflammatory cytokines that tend to be pro-inflammatory, mostly IL-1B and IL-18. And this will dictate how pathologic and how much immune response you have. This is the thing that was responsible for cytokine storm. This was, again, when we COVID first happened in early 2020, cytokine storm was the biggest thing we were seeing. It wasn't COVID. It was this, this, the overreaction of the immune system. And how were we trying to suppress this immune system? Because the people were basically killing themselves because their immune system was in an override. Okay, so COVID is a virulent problem. Let's talk about RSV. This was a common respiratory virus that it's been around forever. It mostly affects the very young children and the very old. We saw many, many children have RSV. It, it puts fear into mothers because of the respiratory status. Um, in the older person, the, the people we really worry about are the COPDers, the asthma, the cardiovascular disease, people that do have these comorbid conditions. And these are the people that there you see the commercial over and over about that should consider the RSV vaccine. It's confined to the lower and small airways disease. So you see a lot of wheezing. You see a lot of respiratory compromise, not much consolidation. Again, there is a vaccine. And as we're going to see over and over, really the only treatment for RSV is supportive care, which is oxygen, chest chest physiotherapy, um, bronchodilator therapy. So that's all we have. We don't have, you know, the magic bullet for it. Influenza, I've seen horrible years of influenza. I've seen years where it's been suppressed, but it's still responsible for approximately 50,000 deaths per year. So this is no small player in our infectious disease wor world. It is still the largest contributor to lost workdays. And, and when we have a bad epidemic, it seems like the world shuts down. It can be a persistent infection that goes on for weeks. We see people that have influenza, that have a chronic cough, chronic respiratory inflammation that can go on for weeks. And, you know, we do all what modern medicine does, corticosteroids, we'll throw some cursory antibiotics at it. We'll give them bronchodilators. So it can really make a person ill for a long period of time. It can also have very mild symptoms. Okay. So again, we're going to talk a lot about something called immunocompetence tonight, because I think that is the real ticket on how we're going to fight these three diseases. Vaccination. I had to bring this up because it is out there. First of all, it is a personal choice. The CDC reports on COVID, at least on a coronavirus vaccine, that 88% had one COVID vaccine, 83% two, 33% received a booster, and 12% are unvaccinated. You know, my daughter's in public health, and I think they're more unvaccinated than that, but that's just an opinion, not a fact. Influenza, it's a yearly vaccine. If you work in healthcare, you work in a hospital, it's almost a mandatory thing. Um, it's based on the most fl likely flu strains. And the, the thing there is that we're they're basically trying to make an educated guess on what is the most likely strain. Some years they're right, some years they're wrong. RSV, as we sort of discussed earlier, is a vaccine that's really mostly indicated for the at-risk populations. Uh, table on the right just gives more information um, so again, I, I, I sit on the, I think it's all personal choice. Uh, so again, it, it's really up to you and your patient to be fully informed on whether to get the vaccine or not. One of the things that we need to talk about is this idea of viral reactivation. Because I began to see this last year in clinical practice, and then I started fooling around because, you know, when you're, you're sitting there and you, people are not getting better, you start to broaden your diagnosis. So viral, what happens is you get one of these three or combination of these viruses which cause immune suppression. This is one of the major problems with COVID. It causes immune suppression. 
So when we get immune suppressed, we alter this TH1 or T helper one to TH2 ratio, which is one of the main ways your body fights in infection. There's this in cascade of in inflammatory cytokines. And now we start to see with the immune suppression, other viral variants that have sat latent in the body have become reactivated. The one I saw most commonly was Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. And it's always interesting because if you ran IgG and IgM titers of EBV, when people are chronically ill, you would see that they're elevated. I started to see this. So again, what more can you do is other than supportive care? But now you began to explain why these people were struggling. Because now they weren't just infected by one virus. All these viruses that had been latent because you had a competent immune system now got came back to life because you had immune suppression. So I want you to understand if you take home nothing from this lecture or talk that immunocompetence or having a very good immune system to me is the best way to combat this. Then we also saw what is called chronic immune response syndrome. These are the people where the immune response turned on, but won't turn off. This is what you see in mold. This is what you see in Lyme. This is what you see in certain infections where we start off with T cell response, and then we get into antibody, antibody, antigen antibody response where it does not turn off. So the body is constantly fighting infection and the body doesn't know when to turn the switch off. This chronic immune response has a huge impact on the body because it requires a lot of energy. And this is what can lead to fatigue. Again, it can leave a person immunosuppressed for a long period of time. People feel bad, you have poor health, and it can lead to morbidity. It can also lead to the whole problem of autoimmunity and if you're working in, in the functional medicine world, autoimmunity is epidemic. We see more autoimmunity now than we've ever seen. And we start to have to ask the question, how and why? So again, we get chronic immune response. It creates a long-term problem. So let's get into prevention. Again, I think as a clinician who's been practicing for a long period of time, having a healthy immune system is the holy grail. Because if you have a competent immune system, the degree of infection should be lower, your risk of co-infection goes down, and you're able to manage the symptoms even though you feel poorly. We have to manage chronic disease and comorbid conditions. We saw with COVID, the obese people, the smokers, um, anybody that had any significant comorbid conditions, it almost seemed like COVID found them. So if, if your patients are not managing their chronic disease, they now have increased risk of bad outcomes. So it is always inherent upon us to try to keep those diabetics in control, try to keep people in somewhat of a lower obese state, which is so difficult and manage this. Diet, again, if you're on an anti-inflammatory diet, you are helping yourself. That boosts your immune system. If you're having the standard American diet, which is high in calories and low in nutritional value, again, you're certainly not helping yourself. Exercise, again, preventative. Even if you just walk, you again, you strengthen the immune system. Sleep, this one gets overlooked because again, we all, so many of us are sleep deprived. But again, we can start to decrease our immune function with lack of sleep. Personal hygiene, hand washing, I used to laugh in because in the, in the ER I worked with, there was somebody who would watch to see if you washed your hands and report you. I just always thought that was interesting, you know, the police. And then finally, stress management. Again, stress can lead to a downregulated immune system. So these are simple things that we do. This is the bread and butter of functional medicine and integrative medicine, healthy immune system, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management. So everything you're doing for your patients is a positive thing to help them be healthy. Other prevention 
And again, I will give you my anecdotal data on this. Vitamin C, we know it's a potent antioxidant and immune support. Vitamin D, and I, I make this comment repeatedly, if we would have given everybody high dose of vitamin D in 2020, we would have had, I think, better outcomes. Zinc, vitamin A can be a benefit. B vitamins, because they can get depleted. And then elderberry or sambucus it can be also uh, immune support. So my quick story on this is my charge nurse at the time came to me early in COVID because we were scared. We were seeing a lot of COVID patients. They were sick. We really didn't have any great um, therapies other than supportive and, and everybody was scared. So she says, what can we do? So in, in my ER, we all went on vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. And although I cannot publish this data, I will tell you that 59 of the 60 people went COVID free, at least through the first round of COVID. So again, anecdotally, we know that again, immune boosting and things that stop viral replication and things that can help the body manage infection can be of great benefit. And we will come back because you'll see this is also in the treatment phase. So again, I start to tell all my patients uh, starting now that you need to start working on your immune system. Let's start making sure your vitamin D levels are adequate. You know, start to consider zinc. Let's get your vitamin C in your system. So we need to get out in front of this thing, make sure we have immunocompetence going into this infectious season. Masking, this is a very controversial thing. So masking, the studies have shown that masking reduces and prevents transmission of respiratory droplets, which is what all these viral infections are. These were N95 and double layer cloths. So anything short of that really does not provide any prevention. Uh, one sh study showed there was a decrease in transmission among healthcare workers. But unfortunately, the most recent Cochrane reviewed, which actually just came out this summer, showed there was no definite benefit of, of the prevention of transmission of viral respiratory droplets using masks. Now, I will tell you, I double masked every day I walked in the ER. If I get on a plane, I wear a mask. So I still believe there is some place for masking in certain areas. I'm my concern is I think the mandate will come soon that everybody will mask again. The problem is we don't have the scientific data to back it up. So again, this will be another one of those, well, we think, and you know, we, we really want more than we think. So very controversial. Again, when I get in large areas with people or airplanes, especially, I tend to mask. So I think there's some degree of benefit. So here's what the rest of the world does for COVID, because here's we're going to start to get into some treatments. All right. So I can tell you, we gave a lot of remdesivir. They say it worked. I'm not so sure. Monoclonal antibodies definitely helped because it lessened the, the, the days of hospitalization. Corticosteroids used a ton of them. I think that they have their place, but mostly it's supportive care. I love, again, I got a daughter in public health who helped me with this, so she's going to put in her stuff. I'm going to tell you that people got better whether we gave them these things or not. This new strain of XBB, they're already showing that Paxlovid is not very effective for it. So again, we don't have a tremendous amount of antivirals that we can find that are efficacious to treat COVID. So now we either have to go back to what can we do? Again, if you, if you get hospitalized, you will be given one of these four things. And we gave lots of it. Treatment influenza. Again, all of these medications must be started within two days of symptoms. They may lessen the course of infection and prevent complications, mostly pneumonia. The most common is, is Tamiflu. Uh, I, I use very little Relenza. I use Zofluza, I think, twice due to mainly patient cost. 
I will tell you that if you're working in a primary care setting during a influenza outbreak, the patients really want Tamiflu because they want to have something. I think Tamiflu has a very high side effect pro profile to it. So just be careful. I always tell people, try to stay to CDC criteria if you are going to prescribe Tamiflu because there are some side effects to it. Again, the earlier you institute it, the more likely you're going to have a success. But, you know, by the time people present, they're two, three, four days into it and looking for help. Treatment of RSV, again, only supportive care. It's humidified air, bronchodilators. In children, we use a lot of racemic epinephrine. We used mistense. We used albuterol. Corticosteroids have limited value that we saw with RSV. So again, all you can do is give these poor kids oxygen, you know, and try to comfort their parents because they, um, these kids are breathing hard and they look sick. Um, it's, it's, it's a scary thing. The problem on the other end is you get people with chronic lung disease. And again, we throw the book at them. We, we give them antibiotics with really trying to prevent some other co, uh, co-infection, but the, we are really limited as far as treatment of these viral infections other than supportive care. So we must talk about post-acute COVID syndrome because this is a real entity that has really affected a significant number of people. So the first part is at least 80% of Americans have had at least one COVID infection. That's data, all right? Two million people have had post-COVID symptoms at 12 months after initial infection. That is a long time to have symptoms after an infection. Here's probably the one of the most concerning things that I came across. These cases can occur in individuals with only mild infections, and one third of these people had no identified pre-existing conditions. And unfortunately, there are still no proven long-term therapy or therapies for long COVID. I will tell you, I treated, I have treated, oh, I, I've tried, I try to keep this part of my practice down. I probably treated 10 cases, of, 10 cases of long COVID, you know, and it's really difficult because these are lawyers and these are business people and people that have to run businesses who can't get off the couch and don't have good faculties and have brain fog. So long COVID is a real entity. We don't know how long it's going to last and we still don't know what what's the final outcome on it so the earlier you can treat long covid if you suspect that the better off you are and again it's again what we found is trying to boost that immune system back to somewhat more normal levels but do not dismiss long covid it is a real entity and these people do suffer so now let's let's turn the page and let's go a different way Let's talk about that. That's so what we talked about were the allopathic and hospital ways of treating infections. But let's look at it from what we do, which is the integrative approach. So, again, there is no proven treatment for viral infections. Supportive care is the mainstay. But we have seen that using antioxidants, zinc ionophores, and supporting the immune system can have better clinical outcomes. And again, these things are very hard to study, uh, again, because it's hard to do. A, everybody wants that random, randomized, double-blind, uh, placebo-controlled study, and it's hard to do that. So they're all based on clinical outcomes. It's all based on, I use this in this work, or she used this, or this doctor, right? This is where you started to see the controversy regarding use of azithromycin and ivermectin and some of the other things that came out. Because, again, some people got better. But we couldn't we couldn't justify the clinical outcomes. So let's sort of jump into this because I think this is where the important piece of the of my talk is. This is what we used, and this is what we found efficacious. Once we thought you you had COVID or you were getting in trouble, we increased your vitamin D from five to ten thousand units a day because it mediates cellular defense and repair mechanisms. So we hit you hard with vitamin D. We used high-dose vitamin C, at least two to four grams daily. 
I will tell you in early COVID, there were studies that came out of China where they were using vitamin C infusions of up to 30,000 grams. That's a huge dose. I can tell you, if you gave me my druthers on how I'd want to be treated, I would take vitamin C infusions. Zinc, because it stops viral repl replication, at least 25 to 50 milligrams a day. We know it reduces the duration of colds by 48%. I like to use vitamin B12 because, again, supports the nervous system, supports the brain, and, and does help people feel better. Vitamin A, you, it, it can be an adjunct at 10,000 units a day. I didn't use as much vitamin a, in, in my clinical practice, the last one I used quite frequently, which is glutathione. We all know glutathione is the most potent antioxidant. And I found when you boosted their glutathione stores, these people tended to feel better, which meant they started to get more immune competent. So again, more empirical data. This is what we used and we found some pretty good effects from this. Other treatment st things that you can use, quercetin or quercetin because it inhibits viral replication. Again, it modulates that NLRP3 inflammasome, but the dose is fairly large. It's a gram BID, which we, we don't usually give that much. Curcumin, we know probably one of the best alternative therapies for in inflammation. Again, modulates that inflammasome. Again, using fairly robust doses, 500 to 1,000 milligrams daily. NAC, Again, this is a precursor to glutathione and promotes immune response. Huge fan of NAC. Doses, again, should be robust, 600 to 900 milligrams. Melatonin, very interesting because melatonin is a very potent antioxidant and can be a, a great adjunct to help them sleep. And again, we start to increase the dose up to 20 milligrams. Sleep doses are usually one to six milligrams, but here's where you start to increase it. ECCG, which is green tea, four cups daily, or you can use a, um, a manufactured product I'm trying to get upwards of 225 milligrams a day. Resveratrol, again, another modulator which mediates the inflammasome, may be useful in influenza. The dose is between 100 to 150 milligrams daily. And the last one on this page is PEA. PEA is classically used, at least for me, with pain control and inflammation. If you're going to use it for, for prevention, it's a 300 milligram BID. Again, as you will see, we generally double it for treatment. Other treatment strategies, if you start to have people with long COVID or people who have lost taste and smell, I will tell you LDN works, okay? It's, it's utterly amazing to see these people that have had no la no taste and no smell for a period of time. You put them on LDN. If you can get them up to three to four, four and a half milligrams, they, it returns. It's, it's an amazing drug. So please consider it. Melatonin, again, we sort of touched on that. Infrared therapy, again, photomodulation is a very up and coming field. I think it has great promise. So infrared is healing. Sauna, again, I love sauna because, again, we're trying to detoxify the body and get some of these. We want the viral virus to shed and we want to get it out of our system. And then the last thing is movement and my incorrect spelling of exercise. I worked with a nurse practitioner who had early case of COVID. And I remember she said, I don't care how bad I felt. I knew I had to get up and move. And when you feel bad, that is the hardest thing. So these are some strategies that you can implore or or use as a clinician to help your patients. So I'm going to kind of start to bring this to a close. In summary, we know it's out there. COVID, influenza, RSV, they continue to present a health case, a health risk. I, I wish they didn't exist, but they're out there. We have to be good practitioners and manage comorbidities. I think the key to prevention and treatment is to make sure we are immunocompetent. And if you get immunocompromised, do everything we can to boost your immune system. Prevention strategies, don't wait. We don't wait till December. If you think that your you your patients are at risk, start as soon as possible. We've talked about treatment, treatment strategies, although not classically proven, they do help your patients. So what we're trying to tell you is 
we're going to try to give you an expanding toolkit because you need more tools to work with because these patients are sick. They're going to get sicker. And if we don't intervene, they, they could have long-term problems. And again, they could be out of work. They, they could lose their career. So anything you can do to help them is always a positive thing. And again, my goal was to let's do whatever we can on the solution phase, even though it doesn't have any clinical improvement because your patients will appreciate that. So this is the triple demic. We saw it last year. Unfortunately, I think we're going to see it this year. And the question you must have to ask yourself, are you prepared and are your patients prepared? Again, I, I think access is always a pleasure to speak for them. And at this point, I am happy to take any questions. Dr. Ferris, amazing lecture, sir. I think for me personally, the biggest takeaway was simply just preventative care, right? Um, we do have quite a few questions in the Q&A. I am going to start with, uh, with this one. Um, can you please provide the dosage and supplements you provided to yourself and the 59 ER, ER providers and employees that didn't get COVID on the initial wave? Great, great question. So this is what we used. From a preventative standpoint, it was zinc. And again, we use zinc picolinate. Again, there are many forms of zinc. And it was 25 milligrams. We used buffered vitamin C at two grams a day. And we used vitamin D at 5,000 units. Excellent. And any specific brands that you recommend? You know, that's always a tough one. There, there are most of the the brands that you will see, the orthomoleculars, the designs for health, all of these are high quality. So if you if you really want to get people healthy, I'm going to tell you, you need to use one of the top name brands. You cannot, I, I just don't have faith in what you're going to get at the drugstore. Fair enough. Beautifully said. And would you recommend the cytokine suppressant supplements at all to help combat um, the triple demic? Again, I don't think we we really have enough data on that to support that. Again, the, the cytokine storm was really supportive care. And again, I still go back to the original strategies. Now, I'm going to take a step in a direction that some people know about that is not proven, but I would tell you, is to consider peptides. And this would be like TA1, which is you can't really find anymore. Now it's thymogen but these are immune boosters that can be of great benefit. Uh, another immune booster is TB4 or TB frag, uh, also known as TB500, that can be also a, a, a great adjunct to people that are sick. Excellent. And so the next question uh, reads, I have seen a lot of literature lately about COVID-19 and decreasing sugar intake to help reduce inflammation. Well, I, I, well, we we know that sugar is inflammatory. So, again, this is back to the prevention thing: is that if if you we, we know longevity, we know health co outcomes are now directly linked to keeping our blood sugar low. So, anything we can, any strategy we can employ to keep our blood sugar down is to your benefit. And remember, all these diseases love sugar right? That's why keto works so well in cancer. Don't give the virus an environment it likes to thrive in. Excellent. And have you seen long COVID affect, um, let's say, hormone replacement therapy in any negative way? 100%. 100%. Again, not predictable. Hmm. But I would be remiss to tell you, it definitely, it suppresses hormones. Okay. And I guess the question is, we know that we can't stop it. We can only help prevent it. And then once you get it, help treat it. Uh, but the question is, can you reverse long COVID through the many functional medicine treatments? Uh, that's a wonderful question. And I, I would love to tell you I had a great answer for that. I can tell you that you can get these people back to a very functioning level from where they came. And this is where modern medicine really doesn't have a toolkit that we have. So 
that has not been studied. I would love to see that studied. I would tell you, you have somebody with long COVID. This is where I, I start to sequentially start to throw the kitchen sink at them. I try my basic strategies. If those don't work, I go to some other strategies till I find something that works. It's a debilitating disease. Beautifully said, sir. Um, well, Dr. Farris, on behalf of Access you know, Medical Laboratories, we'd like to thank you again for an amazing lecture on the potential trip, uh, triple-demic, triple-demic. I have a hard time saying it. Yep. Uh, triple-demic. To our audience, thank you for tuning in to another Access Live where we bring you insight from leading medical experts. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay healthy. Thank and, you, everyone. And I'm going to put in my quick plug for Access again. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry, sir. Just let me tell you, they do a wonderful job. When you start to get in these clinical cases while these people are not getting better, please consider viral panels like Complement and, T and CD4 to CD8 ratios and start to consider EBV titers. And so, again, if, if they're not getting better, you need to broaden where you're looking because you may start to see why they are ill for a long time. And again, I, I've worked with Access over 10 years now. I've, I've always been a fan. So again, to Leo and his team, thank you always. Thank you, Dr. Ferris. Thank you for the plug. Um, and to the audience, yes, we are a full service diagnostic medical laboratory. So we are here to uh, help you um, with your diagnostic needs. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.